Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman, and we're taking a look today at the WD My Passport Wireless Pro. This is a, a new version of a product that WD released probably about two years ago now, and it's essentially a network-attached storage device that you can take with you on the go. It's got a built-in battery, you can function uh, wirelessly, and you can connect your phones and tablets and computers to it and uh, transfer data back and forth, offload things from SD cards, and it even has a Plex server built in, and we're going to be uh, looking at all of that as we go through the video here. There's a lot of stuff to cover on this product, and we're going to try to cover most of it. Now, I do want to mention in the interest of full disclosure that I purchased this with my own funds. Nobody is paying for this review. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own, and nobody is reviewing this content before it is posted. However, in the past, WD has sponsored some videos here on the channel, uh, mostly tutorial videos on the WD MyCloud line of products. However, all my contacts there have left the company. I don't know who else to contact, so I went out and bought this one, and hopefully we'll find some new folks to talk to over there so we can get these a little bit earlier, because I know a lot of you were asking about this a couple of weeks ago, and it took a while for me to get this in. So this is the hardware here. There is a lot of functionality to this. Now, it works in two different ways. Uh, you can connect it directly to your computer, and when it's connected directly, it acts like a dumb hard drive. Uh, when you uh, connect to it wirelessly, you've got all the network-attached storage functionality as well as that Plex server. However, you can't do both. So if it's plugged into your computer as a hard drive, you cannot connect to it wirelessly. Uh, there are ways to disable the, uh, the, the device from turning the wireless stuff off when it's plugged into a computer but when you do that, it only charges the device. So uh, one or the other, a dumb hard drive or a smart network attached storage device. So just keep that in mind as we go through the rest of the review here. Now you'll notice here on the side, there is an SD card slot. And what you can do is take your SD cards. I got a little 128 megabyte card here. Uh, plug that into the side. And what it'll do automatically, if you can configure it to do this, uh, it will copy the contents of that card uh, to your hard drive automatically. And it's actually done a pretty nice job of incrementally copying things. So I had a, a big card. It had about seven gigabytes worth of stuff on there. It took about 12 or 13 minutes for that whole uh, file to transfer, all those files to transfer off of that card onto the hard drive. Then I went out and added some more files to that card, plugged it back in, and it only copied the new files over. So it does a good job of uh, keeping track what it already did. You can see here now it just copied the contents of whatever's on this card uh, over to it, and we'll see what that looks like in a minute. But basically it just dumps it off into full there's uh, on the hard drive there. On the side here, uh, you have a, a couple more ports to look at. So you have a USB 2.0 port over here. You can plug in additional USB devices to this, like your phone or your memory sticks and stuff, and it will also copy those things over automatically as well. Again, you can turn that feature off. You have the option, too, on both the SD card and the USB port to move files also. So you can have it programmed to dump everything off the card and then erase the card. A little dangerous to do that. I often like to have uh, this kind of serve as a backup versus an, a primary storage location, but if you're really in a bind, you need to get that memory card cleared off to record some more stuff. Uh, you can pop, pop it in, move those files off, delete the card, and keep going if you wish. And there's also an ability to charge things through this also. It's got a pretty big battery, 6,400 milliamp hours. Uh, so if you have a phone plugged in, you'll charge at about one and a half amps at five volts, so about the uh, speed of a standard phone charger. No rapid charging or anything, but you can charge your phone with this. It will eat into the battery life of the device, though, so you do want to keep that in mind if you are uh, going to be out away from power for a few days, but it's nice as a backup pa uh, power source that when your phone is plugged in, uh, you can have it charge the device. Um, they say about 10 hours of battery life on this if you're uh, streaming a single movie over Wi-Fi to it. They call it all-day battery life. This is a really hard uh, device to kind of judge its battery life by, but I found that if you're using it occasionally to transfer some things over with, uh, maybe uh, you know just move some files back and forth, dump a few memory cards out, I think you'll probably get close to that 8 to 10 hour mark. If you're doing a lot of streaming and having multiple users connect to it, that will certainly drain the battery faster. If you're really working that Plex server, uh, that will eat it away also. So I think if you're doing a lot of media streaming with multiple users, expect about five hours or so. Uh, and if you just have yourself connecting occasionally, uh, eight to 10 is probably reasonable, especially if you're turning it off in between sessions, you'll probably get uh, some more out of it. Now this is USB 2.0 over here. This is a USB 3.0 slot for charging as well as connecting to your computer, but it's not an inbound slot. So this is only for connecting back to your computer uh, or to the power source. They also give you a charger and a cable uh, in the box as well. And you have a power button over here. So that is the overall hardware. Again, this is about uh, $200 as you see it with the two terabyte hard drive. There's also a three terabyte version for 229. Now let's get into the interface, how it works on a computer. We'll take a look at that. We'll look at the iPhone and Android app, and then we'll boot up Plex and see how that works too. Let's get into it. 
Now this is the home page for the device's web-based control panel, and the way you get to this is uh, to turn it on, first of all, but then uh, connect to it wirelessly. So when it turns on, there's two wireless radios built in. Uh, there's a five gigahertz wireless AC radio for faster speeds. There's also a slower 2.4 gigahertz radio, which will work with older devices. You can connect to either one of those, and when you do, you'll be able to uh, go to mypassport.local in your web browser, and then you will get this, and uh, this is the control panel. And what you'll get here is the battery life. Uh, you'll get an idea of how much space you have left and how your files are distributed on there and a few other things as well. And what you can do first is go over to the Wi-Fi option. And what it'll do is it'll allow you to connect to a wireless network. And this is where uh, things get a little iffy for me on the security side because uh, when you connect up to that wireless network, uh, it will give you the option to uh, just have your files shared over that network to anyone. So you can see here when I clicked on one of these wireless networks, it has this uh, checked on by default. Uh, which means that anyone who's on that wireless network with you, uh, they can get access to your files. Now the option here says typically this option is unchecked for public Wi-Fi networks, but I don't know how they differentiate that. Maybe they look for something that's unprotected before uh, enabling this option, but uh, my advice would be if you are anywhere other than home, uncheck this before you activate it. Otherwise, uh, anyone on your network who's there with you in the coffee shop or wherever uh, is going to be able to get access to this because there's no way to lock this out uh, with a user name and password. The only real security here is the uh, Wi-Fi password that you set. And if you uh, connect to a wireless network locally, uh, you lose that functionality. And you'll see here as I uh, browse my network, I have uh, the My Passport here on my list of available devices to connect to on my Mac. You'll see something similar on Windows. I'm connected as a guest and I have full access to uh, everything that is stored on this hard drive. So my advice is uncheck that uh, and or just don't connect to any Wi-Fi networks either. Now, why would you want to connect to a Wi-Fi network? Well, there are times when it's actually very useful to have this available to uh, people on your network. So right now, this is on my home network. If I wanted to copy files from three different computers at the same time, uh, they could all connect to this without having to connect to it individually. So that's useful. Uh, what it also does is that if you are on a uh, Wi-Fi only device, you can uh, get the internet through here by connecting to that Wi-Fi. So basically this connects to the Wi-Fi that has the internet, you connect to it, and then the internet is passed through uh, from the internet Wi-Fi to the, uh, the little Wi-Fi on the device here, and that's how you can get it back to your phone. So there are some reasons why you want to do that, but you definitely want to secure yourself and really figure out the security of the network you're on before you do that, but it would have been nice for them to allow you to set up a username and password uh, to keep prying eyes out. All right, so with that warning out of the way, that is what you can do here with connecting to local wireless networks. Again, if you really want to secure yourself, don't connect it to a wireless network and just connect to it directly via its own wireless. As long as you have a good password built into the device, nobody can get in and you will uh, have a uh, private experience with it, but you won't be able to get on the internet also. Uh, so just uh, keep all of that in mind as you're uh, going through everything. Uh, here you can set up the user and uh, the password, but the password is only for this control panel. So by default, the password for the control panel is also off too. So uh, there are some things if you are concerned about security, you should be concerned about. Uh, you can also get access to its little SSH server. There's an FTP option too, so you can set up a small FTP server on it. Uh, over here on hardware, you can get an idea of your battery life. Uh, you can set it to uh, do better on battery life than performance, but you lose one of the wireless radios in the process. I think it disables the uh, five gigahertz radio here if you go to battery life option here. So it disables one of the wireless radios to give you a little bit more battery life if you want that. Now drive lock over here is what I was talking about earlier when you connect it to your computer. So when you plug this directly into your PC, again, it disables that wireless option uh, as well as all the other features uh, related to the SD card uh, transfers and everything else. But uh, if you turn on that drive lock, when you plug it into a computer, it will just start charging, uh, but it will not appear as a uh, external drive to the computer. You can still though connect to it over the network. So it's basically just a way to ensure it's always charging and it doesn't just switch over into that uh, regular hard drive mode. And over here in the media option is where you set up your media servers. Right now I have the Plex media server enabled uh, and Plex is a great uh, series of applications applications that run on just about everything actually, from game consoles all the way to computers to tablets and smartphones and everything in between. Uh, I've done a lot of uh, videos on Plex. I'll put a link down to a few of them in the description so you can get an idea as to what it is if you haven't heard of it before. Uh, but it's a really nice, robust media serving uh, application and it does somewhat run okay on here and we'll get to that in a minute. Now, if you don't need the Plex server, uh, you can turn on the Twonky server instead and this just uh, acts as a way of getting video out to your uh, DLNA compatible devices like 
like smart televisions and other things. So Plex is a much more robust interface. It has a really nice application that accompanies it. So if you want a nice interface, uh, put Plex on. If you just want to connect to your existing smart television, uh, then you can use the Twonky server, but you can't have both on. Uh, it's one or the other. But the Plex server does have a DLNA uh, server built into it also. Uh, so you may just want to just leave the Plex server on and uh, go with that. A couple more things here. Media account just lets you know what you have on the device for uh, videos and music and other things. It keeps a uh, idea of those things so that when you are connecting with that uh, Twonky server, it will uh, delineate everything into whether it's a photo, video, or audio file and uh, present that to compatible devices. Over here is how you configure what happens when you plug in an SD card or USB device. So right now I have it set to copy things off the card, which means that it will copy the files off the card and then leave the card intact. If I select move, it will delete everything on the card uh, after it imports. Automatic import is exactly what you think it is. If you uh, plug in the card, it will just uh, suck everything in. So uh, that's how you do that there. There is a way to uh, plug the card in and then push a button here on the side to initiate that. So I can push the SD card button here to uh, ingest that card. Uh, there's also a way to do it through the control panel too. Now earlier I ran a speed test using its AC radio and we got uh, transfer speeds that weren't as fast as I would like them to be, about 24 megabytes per second on the writes and about 20 megabytes per second or so on the reads back to the computer. And these things were right next to each other too. So uh, not the fastest wireless connection. I think it's not going to do well when you've got a lot of people hitting it all at once. So you definitely want to uh, limit the number of users that are doing heavy file transfers or uh, media streaming from it. I think smaller video files should do okay, uh, but larger ones will certainly bog it down. And certainly when you're writing large files to it, I think you probably want to do those large file transfers one user at a time. But if you plug the device directly into your computer, uh, you'll see speeds that I've seen with other uh, traditional spinning hard drives like this one has, so about 100 megabytes or so uh, in both directions when directly connected via USB 3.0. All right, let's take a look at the Plex server, and you can get at it just by clicking on Configure here, and that will take you over to uh, the Plex configuration page, and uh, you can also connect this to your Plex account. So if you have other Plex servers, this will appear like any other Plex server you have uh, on your account. You can get at it uh, from anywhere in the world too if it's on the internet. So it does function just like other Plex servers do. Uh, it will be limiting as you'll see in a few minutes, but it is able to do that. Uh, one thing I'm having trouble doing though is getting my thumbnails to generate. So uh, that's the one thing that I found doesn't work too well on here just yet is getting those thumbnails brought down. And I need to play with that a little bit more because this is a movie that uh, should have that. Now, one of the other things I noticed here too is when I went in to edit my libraries, um, it does give you some weird stuff here when you're looking for the folders to connect to. So you do have to create the folders yourself. Uh, and what happened here is I noticed it has four different aliases all for the drive storage here. So uh, you can click on any one of these and then select the folder that you wish to uh, point the library at. But uh, this could have been a little bit cleaner to me. I don't know what this MQ thing is here, but I think this is something that is supposed to be behind the scenes. So I would just uh, click on one of these storage options here and select your folder from that. Uh, but once you're connected to it, you can connect all of your other devices to it as well. But uh, if you followed my video on Plex, you'll know that one of the big features that Plex offers is something called transcoding, where it can take uh, large files that are not uh, well suited for mobile devices and uh, make them smaller on the fly to play them back. But as expected, the Plex server on here is not powerful enough to do the video conversion in real time. So I have a Blu-ray MKV file. I know this is not fair, but it's a something I always test with. And uh, we've got a big Blu-ray MKV file here. It's essentially the same video file that was on that Blu-ray disc. If I go to try to play that back on my web browser here, it's telling me uh, that it is not powerful enough to convert the video. But what I did find is that my phone is able to play back the video without the conversion. So if you have a video file that uh, is able to uh, run on your device natively, then it should work over this Plex server. And was also interesting, and I'll switch back here to my uh, computer screen now, um, is that it is actually able to transcode audio in real time. So if we go over to my uh, status board here as to what's uh, being sent to my phone, uh, we're getting a direct stream of the video. So in other words, it's not doing the transcoding of the video, but it is transcoding the audio from DTS HD uh, to stereo sound. And uh, although we don't have the sound up right now for copyright reasons, I can tell you the sound actually works. And uh, this device is able to keep up with that audio transcode. But you will find when you're trying to scrub through different parts of these large video files that it will uh, kind of get itself bogged down quite a bit. And I would imagine too, doing that audio transcoding is going to eat away at the battery life a bit as well. This is really not something this was designed to do. So my advice 
also be to use files on the Plex server here that you know will work on the phone without any transcoding. And the best way to test that uh, would be to use the WD app that we're going to look at in a minute. Uh, load the files onto the drive and try to play them back through their app first. And if it works on the phone through that app, uh, then it will work on Plex without transcoding. And that's one good way to test it to make sure that your file doesn't require any extra work. And I've got one here. This is one of the sample files that came on the drive when I uh, booted it up here. I'll just click on play and you can see now it's running through the Plex server and uh, it should come up pretty quickly here. I did find that seeking to uh, different parts of the video, even with these non-transcoded files, does take a little bit longer, but uh, this one plays really pretty quickly, again, because there's no transcoding required. Both the video and the audio are able to stream directly to the phone uh, without any kind of work on the part of the drive to get it to my phone. So that is probably uh, the best way to go with this Plex server. But if you've been kind of disappointed with the media servers on these portable drives in the past, it is kind of nice to have a Plex server built in that you can take with you. Uh, just make sure your files are prepared properly. And of course, there's a mobile app, and this uses the same app that the MyCloud devices use. So you download the WD MyCloud app. You can connect to your MyCloud devices if you have any, as well as the Passport. You can even move files back and forth between them. You can connect up to your cloud accounts and move files uh, between those accounts and your drives as well. So it really is uh, very tightly integrated with all the other WD products you might have on your network. I'm going to click on the gear icon real quick because you can configure a lot of this device uh, via the mobile app. So you can see here we have our SD card settings here. I can uh, you know, set the thing to move things over. It's funny, they have different terminology though. So on the web browser, they call it move. On here, they say delete SD card files after import, which I think makes more sense than just move. Uh, so it's interesting, they have different terminology for the same features uh, on the app here. You can see there's also an import button to initiate an import or manually if you wish to do that uh, while you're in there. The one thing that was missing from this though is the Plex server. So you can't configure the Plex server through the mobile app. Uh, you can turn the Twonky server on from here, but that will turn off the Plex server on the other side of the uh, interface there. So uh, you'll definitely want to use the web browser for uh, making the Plex configuration. And then of course you can go in and browse uh, what's on the device. So we can go back to our passport here, uh, look at our storage here, and uh, look at what's on the device here. So you can see what we brought in earlier on those SD cards. We had that Toshiba card that I plugged in uh, at the beginning of the video here. It basically copied the entire thing over and I have access to all of my photos that were on that device as well. So you can see I've got some probably, probably a 10 or 11 year old photo from my old uh, Palm Pilot phone here. Uh, you can see how that is uh, working there. So you pretty much have access to all the files. Anything your iPhone can read, uh, this can read on here. And it works pretty well, I think, uh, for a mobile device. You can also set your phone to back up uh, to this automatically every time you add new photos to it. So it has a lot of the features that uh, if you are using a WD MyCloud or a similar device, uh, you'll be able to do that uh, on here as well. And then on your computer, the best way to get at it is just using your uh, standard interface, whether it's on the Mac or Windows or Linux, uh, to get at the drive as a regular file share. So you can see here it's showing up uh, on the list of my available network drives, and I can just go in here and connect to it. Unfortunately, though, without a password, so we're getting into everything, including those SD card imports, uh, without having to log in as a user first. And that's the biggest flaw I see with this thing. I would like for there to be some uh, usernames and passwords so that when you are uh, using this to connect to a existing wireless network, you can limit who gets onto the drive because right now everybody in my house uh, can get into this drive unless I uncheck that box. Uh, beyond that though, it's a nice single user device. I think it's got a decent media server built in with that Plex server provided your files are uh, able to play back natively on your phone. You have a nice uh, app to access them with. I do like uh, how nice this uh, SD card transfer works and how it does an incremental backup every time the, the uh, card is plugged back into it. So uh, all those things were pretty nice about it. It does work very nicely. The battery life I think is going to be decent, especially if you're using it uh, really as a backup device while you're on the road. You can you know, offload some files, turn it back off, and keep going. I do recommend though that when you are using it, uh, you don't move it. It is a device designed to be portable, but it is a mechanical spinning hard drive, and those do not like to be jostled around while they're doing stuff. So I would suggest when you have file transfers to do, even if you're out in the middle of nowhere, uh, put it down on a rock or something, keep it stable, get those files transferred, and then turn it off and keep going again. That's the only uh, uh, thing you want to be careful about for uh, keeping your data safe. So that is the WD My Passport Wireless Pro, and this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by my Patreon supporters. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash Patreon to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.